One of the things that I really believe in in Peloton Transit is partnerships. And sometimes I like to attribute that to the fact that I'm a runner. And my attitude in running is much like it is in transit. If you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. Welcome to Transit Unplugged. I'm Paul Comfort. Good to be with you on another edition of the world's leading transit executive podcast, Transit Unplugged in depth this week with our special guest, Kendra McGady, who is director of Pelavan Transit in Oklahoma. Welcome, Kendra. Thank you, Paul. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Kendra and I recently were part of another podcast series uh, funded by uh, CTAA and the Federal Transit Administration on preventing driver assaults. And uh, I interviewed her for that podcast, and I was just captivated by her story and what she's doing there and the Cherokee Nation and wanted to have her as part of our podcast. If you want to hear the other podcasts that we were both on, go to safety, the number four, and then transit safetyfortransit.org. She's on episode six. Uh, Scroll down to the bottom of the page. It's sponsored again by the Community Transportation Association of America. And it's basically training materials for drivers uh, to and for transit agencies on how to prevent operator assaults. And you had one, right, Kendra, at your agency? And you talked to us about that. I did, Paul. Unfortunately, we had a a physical assault a couple of years ago, and we had a verbal assault recently, which is what you and I really touched on in our conversation. Yeah. Is that the one where the guy took a vehicle and they chased him down to the casino? I mean, what a great yeah. story. I know. He, he backed it right in the handicap spot and parked it for us. I'm telling you what, Paul. <laughs> I want you to tell the story later in the podcast. We won't start out with that, but uh, that's a really interesting story and, and a great lesson for all of us about how to respond to these things. But first off, welcome, Kendra, to the show. So you're in sunny Oklahoma, huh? Tell us about yourself a little bit and about the agency that you represent there. All righty. Well, my name again is Kendra McGady, and I have been the director of Pelvan Transit located in Northeast Oklahoma for almost seven years. It will be seven years on March 1st, and I can hardly believe how fast right. time flies. Yeah. But we are located in the corner of Oklahoma, um, and we cover seven counties, 4,466 square miles. Wow. Uh, let's see. Today, as of today, we have 64 vehicles <laughs> and about 40 employees. And we do a basic uh, demand response service that we operate um, from 8.30 to 4.30, uh, Monday through Friday. And then we have an after-hours transportation project that we are the lead agency on as well, known as PIC Transportation, which is a regional on-demand transit system that I have four partners in, and we operate from 5 to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday and 10 to 2 on Saturday. We do the Veterans Ride Connect project out here, um, which is a discounted veterans program, again, with my partners, who you know I love and respect. And we also provide transportation services to the nine tribes of Ottawa County and the Cherokee Nation. We got a lot going on, Paul. Yeah, that's amazing. I, uh, my very first job in transit uh, was for the Queen Anne's County Department of Aging, and I had that job for seven years. It's, I think the job I've had the longest was my very first job. So really? congratulations to you on your anniversary, um, which will have come and gone by the time people hear this uh, <laughs> later in March. But um, so th- the reason I wanted you on, we, we have a lot of large transit agency CEOs on, but I wanted to have, I thought you were a great representative of something that we haven't really talked about before on the show. And that is, you know, working with the Cherokee Nation, working with Native American tribes, the transportation kind of in the heartland of America. Talk to us about that some. You bet. Well, I, you know, I'm very proud member of the, of the Cherokee Nation. I'm a citizen. I want to make that known first of all, but um, what we do out here um, with our tribes is really interesting. And we're very fortunate in the state of Oklahoma to be in a very tribe heavy region. And, and we have great working partnerships with the tribes out here. Um, what we do uh, with the Cherokee Nation is rather than creating their own transit system, the Cherokee Nation contracts with four transit providers, public transit providers, and integrates into that system with them and contracts. And it is a very beneficial system. Basically, we bill for actuals and we provide discounted transportation to tribal citizens throughout the 14 counties that make up the Cherokee Nation. It's demand response. So people call in and make a a book a trip. Yes, sir. At this point, they do do demand response and it runs from 830 in the morning to 430 p.m. 
But as we get ready to go out for RFP for on-demand technology, the Cherokee Nation will be leaning into on-demand technology as well. So they are going to have what we refer to as a multimodal system because they will have different ways to book and different transportation systems that they offer there. And talk to us about the Cherokee Nation. I mean, a lot of folks on the coast may not be, you know, of our country and around the world may not be familiar with how this all works. Tell us about how all that works. How are how are these these tribal nations set up and and here in the U.S. and how does that interact with you as a transportation provider? Well, as you know, the tribal nations are are sovereign for one thing, and that is the most important thing that people need to remember when they talk about dealing with uh, tribal entities. They are sovereign nations and they operate as their own nation, much like the United States does. Um, We simply reside in the state of Oklahoma, but make up a great portion of the state of Oklahoma, as you well know. And for the Cherokee Nation in particular, um, we have 39 federally recognized tribes in the state of Oklahoma, um, five known as the civilized tribes. And of those tribes, um, they all have their own transit system, with the exception of the Cherokee Nation, who integrates with public transit. And so I'm going to talk about that and how we establish that. Um, When it came time to begin, when the Cherokee Nation decided that they were going to start applying for 5311 funds, they decided to take a more innovative approach. Um, One of the things that's uh, maybe not a well-known fact about the Cherokee Nation is that they're a very innovative, uh, business-savvy tribe, and, and they promote coordination with the state of Oklahoma on a very significant level and have a great history of working together with the state. So I think that they wanted to continue in that tradition and reached out to their public transit providers. And what we do is the Cherokee Nation applies for their own 5311C grant, and then they distribute the funds through the four transit providers. Uh, We build them for actuals. They purchase vehicles for us and let us utilize them in our transportation system. And the great benefit of it all is that these systems are not just for tribal citizens. It promotes a better, more efficient service for every citizen of the state of Oklahoma and the Cherokee Nation residing within the tribal nation. Do you only provide transportation in that in that service area of the Cherokee Nation or do you go outside those boundaries? Uh, we do go outside of the boundaries in some cases. For example, um, our tribes also work very well together in Oklahoma. We have an interlocal agreement with uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation, now, no, now known as Muscogee Nation, um, so that we transport in and out of their service area. And it's the first agreement of that kind in the state of Oklahoma, but I look to see that um, branch out to the other tribal uh, transportation systems. But yes, we go in and out of some of the urban areas as well, but we run around the Cherokee Nation for the most part, due in small part to the the northeastern corner of my section is uh, nine tribes of Ottawa County, which are smaller tribes, and they band together to create a tribal transit consortium, and then they contract with uh, with Pelvan Transit to provide those services as well. Do you... um... How does the tribe interact with the state of Oklahoma? Is it kind of like a county government? Uh, Would that be analogous to it? So you all kind of run your own public works and and, you know, sewer systems and and parks or whatever you have there. And you interact with the state as a county or are you completely separate from the state? How does that work? Um, Well, that's a pretty uh, in-depth conversation. Okay, um, all right. And I will touch on that to the extent that I can. I wouldn't want to represent the state and the tribal. Okay, sure, yeah. As far as transportation goes, I can, I can talk about that. The Cherokee Nation has given, they, they are the first nation to enter into um, a self-governance compact with the USDOT. So as far as our transportation funds come down, we receive them in bulk, and then we are able to distribute those through our transportation department as we see fit, which is a great th- uh, project or process. And I would like to see other tribes lean into that because nobody knows how to serve citizens better than the nation in which the citizens reside. And that branches out to tribal nations as well. And how is it funded? Does the Cherokee Nation uh, have, uh, as a as a sovereign entity, do they have sources of income? Do they tax people or how do they make their money and how do they provide you money? Um, the Cherokee Nation um, generates their own revenue through their many multiple business um, endeavors, as well as receiving federal funds. And tell us about some of the new things you've got going on, because you've got some great programs. You mentioned PIC as one, but uh, tell us about all the cool stuff you've got going on. OK, well, you know, one of the coolest things that we have going on right now is the PIC Transportation Project. Um 
this again, one of the things that I really believe in in Pelvian Transit is partnerships. And sometimes I like to attribute that to the fact that I'm a runner. And my attitude in running is much like it is in transit. If you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. So um, we created this regional on-demand transportation system with our partners, which is great because I think that as we see, let's just make an example of healthcare becoming more regionalized, you're going to see transportation need to do the same thing. Um, so we wanted to tackle some common issues um, that we were having, uh, including a, a a more efficient, uh, faster, um, on-demand type of system with extended hours. So that's what we did. Um, the PIC transportation project has um, almost outlived its pilot project phase, and we we're getting ready to go out for RFP for some new technology to roll that into our daytime system and to continue the after-hours project. And we're really looking forward to that. Um, we have uh, several different agencies in Oklahoma that want to get involved in that. So we're really looking forward to that. But again, it's a step-by-step process that takes a lot of time. And um, one other thing that I thought was really cool that I just got um, a confirmation on today is that uh, there's a lot of um, extra ARPA funds running around out there in some of these counties. So I decided to hit one of my counties up and they agreed to give $25,000 in fares to our Veterans Ride Connect project, which I am just blown away by. Um, We have a 501c3 here at Grand Gateway. I do work for a council of government, so I'm very fortunate. So they donated the $25,000 to our foundation, and we will draw out to provide discounted trips to veterans across the state of Oklahoma for what we foresee to be the next two years. So we're really looking That's forward exciting. to That's exciting. Yeah. That's great. It's really great. At what is your normal fare to ride the, your service? Well, you know, we do $2 a mile for a BDR trip, which is what we refer to as our out-of-town trips. As far as uh, citywide service, we have a couple of different price structures there. We do um, a $1, a $2, and a $3, depending on when you book and what your age is. So okay. we really try to still, um, w- with the demand response system, a pre-book environment, you know, it's very important that they do a pre-book. But as we move into this technology and get the on-demand implemented in the daytime system, we really look to push to drive people towards the app for same-day booking in particular. That's good. What type of vehicles do you have in your fleet? Okay, let's see. Well, we have a number of minivans and we use Ford Transits and and we use Ford Cutaways. So I don't have any CDL vehicles in my fleet and I have no EVs as of yet. So okay. are you having trouble recruiting and retaining drivers or is it easier since you don't have CDLs? Uh, you know what? I, I You would think that it would have been easier. And that was certainly uh, my thought process when I moved into this. But no, we we are suffering like everyone else across the board in in public transit and a number of different industries that, yes, we are suffering from staffing shortages. And we've done everything that we can. Um, You know, we have a very flexible with our system running from 830 in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. We have a number of different hours that you can work. Um, We have a number of different service areas, considering that PIC does cover uh, 22,000 square miles and you could go in and out of that. Um, But we just haven't seen, we also gave a salary increase. Um, in the last year, but we just haven't seen a return to the workforce, Paul, the way that we had really hoped for. So how did you get involved in all this, Kendra? <laughs> well, the truth is uh, my former boss, I just got a, a um, our, our executive director just retired and um, he stole me. He stole me away <laughs> from planning and development. Um, obviously, I'm a very shy person. So I came from a fundraising <laughs> background. <laughs> a fundraising background. Okay. Yeah. I sure did. Which wow. is that? come in very handy for me in public transit. Um, with our foundation in particular, I am not above. In fact, I'm, I'm famous for going to uh, Rotary Club meetings and rodeos and different things and asking people just simply to pass the hat. Um, so, but long wow. story short, I had a different job and um, the uh, my predecessor here at Televan Transit had decided that she would retire and and they thought of me. So Ed called me one day and said, Hey, I, I'd like for you to come out and talk to me about running Pelavan Transit. And <laughs> I remember thinking, Pelavan Transit, I've seen those little vans around town. Well, how hard could that be? <laughs> Seven little years later. I know. Little yeah. bit I know. So. so you've mentioned that you have a foundation. Tell yes, us sir. about that and its role in helping to fund what you do there. 
Well, you know, it is um, a, a huge help. I will say that. What we did at Grand Gateway, again, I'm a council of government. So public, uh, Pell Van Transit is just one of the departments. We do our area agency on aging. We do rural fire. We do CDBG grants and REAP grants and, and um, a number of different things. And we also created a community development foundation several years ago, a 501c3. So we are able to collect money through their donations um, for specific projects. Um, we do a lot of veterans fairs and... Um, Oh, I just collect a lot of money through there going to different foundations and things like that. We've received private foundations to assist with fairs, um, our veterans in particular, but we're also able to use it um, for road projects and things like that um, here at Grand Gateway. So what else you want to tell me? Hey, I know that things have been a little bit crazy in transit for the last couple of years. And while we still face a lot of challenges and, and there's a lot of hurdles in front of us, I, I think that I'm very pleased with how transit has been so resilient through the last couple of years and and seeing um, a lot of these discretionary grants. Um, I'm, I'm really pleased with the FTA opening up so many opportunities for different transit systems out there, in particular in the tribal, um, with those big significant um, differences as numbers comparable to the tribal transportation systems and the number of tribes in our country. I, I really... I'm anxious to see some great tribal transit systems established. So, all right. So now we got to go to the story. So, okay. uh, so Kendra had a um, an incident occur, and uh, we were, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, we were talking about how to prevent driver assaults because that is a real issue across our industry. Whether you're in a large agency like New York City or a smaller one such as Kendra runs, we still face these issues, and we want to make sure we protect our operators. So, tell us a little about the story. It's, it has its humor in it, even though it it's, it's it's not a it's not a you know it's not a funny thing overall. But it was a a humorous story how you described it. Yes, and in hindsight, you can always laugh about things like that because right, you yeah. have to, right? Before we hear Kendra's story and the rest of her interview with Paul, let's hear from Mike Bismeyer and Mike's minute about leadership and kindness in public transit. And by the way, next week is Think Transit, and it's not too late to register. Paul and I will be there along with a lot of past guests. We hope you'll join us. Go to www.trapezegroup.com slash thinktransit to learn more and register. Hope to see you there. And now, Mike. Hi, this is Mike Bismar, Transit and Kindness Advocate, and this is Mike's Minute, where we talk about mentorship, leadership, and kindness with the hopes that'll inspire you to pay it forward. Today's guest and leader, Kendra McGady, helps for many memories. As she speaks about her industry, leading and advancing her agency, it again reiterates that it's agencies of all sizes that contribute to the overall success of our industry. Kendra sharing insights about their day-to-day -day roadmap and technologies that will make them better, along with her contributions to the driver assault prevention conversation, again reiterate the passion and commitment from our industry, folks trying to make transportation better every single day. Kendra also being from Oklahoma instantly brought back some great memories to the surface for myself. As you've heard me talk about mentors over the years, one of the most influential mentors I've ever had in the industry was the late Cody Ponder, who was serving as Director of Transportation in CARP, Oklahoma, when he unfortunately began his 28-month battle of cancer, passing in 2013. Cody and his team were some of the most incredibly kind, sharing, enjoyable transportation folks I've ever met in my career. The timing of Kendra being a guest was perfect, as she mentioned she's also an avid runner, a passion of mine as well, and we are less than a week away from the annual Run for Cody Outpace Cancer Run that's held in Oklahoma every year in honor of Cody and his legacy. These are further examples of how transit reaches into our communities in ways we can never account for, enhancing and changing lives for others. Transit by nature is kind, the reason I love this great industry. Thanks for listening. Have a great week. Kindness is cool. We were just kicking off PIC. Um, we had been, we had received the grant. It was a $1.5 million grant. We had a, we were just really going all out with it. Um, we had our, the Oklahoma Secretary of Transportation, Tim Gatz, come down and do our kickoff book, the first trip on um, pick transportation. And it was in Owasso. And the news was there. And it's important that I tell this story because, well, you'll hear, well, the news came. Fox News came and they did a great story. And the guy was really animated the way he talked. And, and he was just, hey, this is pick. And it was just really a great time for us. And we were very excited. And, and the very next day, <laughs> the second day that pick was up and running and operational, I get a phone call 
that one of our drivers has been assaulted. And not only has he been insult- assaulted, but they have stolen our vehicle. So what happened was our, yes, it's terrible. There are, there are some restrictions to the grants. As you can imagine, we can't just go crazy operationally when we have this specific amount of funding. So citywide service is what pick transportation is limited to. Um, so my driver was parked at um, a convenience store in his service area. Second night of pick, everyone's fresh faced and excited and, and um, you know, sharp and, and ready to rock and roll. And, and um, he's sitting there um, getting himself something to drink and just kind of going out the scenery waiting for a trip. And a man approaches the vehicle and says that he needs a ride. And so uh, my driver was excited and said, sure, do you have... Um, uh, pick is utilized through the Uber app. So he asked, do you have the app? Can you book a trip? And the guy said, no, I, I don't have that. And I don't have a smart son. So my wonderful driver says, well, let me call the call center and we'll get you an account established that way because we can book a, a number of different ways. You can use the call center or the app. So he calls and starts the process and everyone just, you know, all rosy and, and getting through it. And then he says where he wants to go, which is to a casino located in Tulsa. And this is outside is of, outside your service area. Right. Outside of our service area. So we tell him that, unfortunately, we can't take him. And the guy becomes very irate. He reaches in through the car and closed fist punched my driver in the face. Oh, um, man. I, I didn't remember that part. Closed clap. fist punch him. Oh, my punch, gosh. Clap, clap, punches him. And my driver, that big guy, and and, and he's scooted out and, and, and got out and was okay. He didn't get okay. hurt. Um, it was just, it, it, it looks very bad. Um, yeah. But he closed fist at him and my driver got out and pulled himself out of the vehicle and the guy just jumps in the past driver's seat and drives away. It's you a take, car or a van? It's a Pella van. It's the brand new pick van. That Your just brand started. new van. Yeah. Oh my and goodness. All, and so once I find out from my, my driver that he is okay and he says, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, the guy tried to get at me, but he didn't really get me. It was just, you know, it was a, it was a tense situation, but it's okay. So then I'm furious <laughs> and I say, all right, we've got to Uber this guy. Find out where he's at. This guy's driving down the road in my vehicle. And all I can picture is the man from Fox in a yeah. here saying, hey, everybody, the pick vehicles, you know, been stolen and, and on its way. Long story short, you know, uh, the guy took our vehicle. He drove it to the casino, backed it into the handicap spot. Because he had handicap tags, right? He had handicap tags. Um, so they went and they found him through video surveillance. He had th- thrown our technology out the window, so we couldn't. Uh, oh, wow. So anyways, we're, the guy gets to the casino. We go and get him. We recover our vehicle. And the part that is humorous is that the man, clearly when we got it back, we see that he has wrecked. He is, it looks like a semi, that he sideswiped a semi and it popped oh my God. fire. So he gets out of the pill van and he changes the tire and then he puts the jack back right on it and drives to <laughs> me. So oh and a half drank bottle of Mad Dog 2020 in the front seat. Yeah. And, we, and we're all like, okay, give us that. <laughs> yeah, that's what I remember. That part of the story. You know, yeah. Wow. Then, <laughs> that he, that he, he fixed his own flat tire and goes and parks in the handicap spot, goes in the casino and then gets captured. And, and was he prosecuted? Did they... Was they prosecuted. Yes, sir, he was. So he was prosecuted. It, it was a crazy situation, but one that we learned from. What you learn from that? And how's your driver doing? My driver is doing great. He has a great attitude and he was fine right at the bat. What we learned is that, um, much like you said in the beginning of this portion of our, of our conversation here, we're not exempt from those things happening to us. They simply do not only happen um, in large urban areas um, on fixed route service. It happens everywhere. And we also realized that it was time to really um, make some investment in in the safety of our drivers. And so we did invest in a live feed camera system that includes a um, a panic button. Because again, as we can laugh about this, and the driver that we had is a very cool driver. He's a big guy. He's really laid back. I mean, this could have been anyone. It could have yeah, been one of right. my young ladies who drives my vehicle. Um, it could have been a, a very different situation. So again, learn that we aren't exempt from that and that we have to take particular precautions to protect our drivers. We also work with our um, our local law enforcement to make sure that they understand what we're doing and that we have a direct line to them whenever we need it. So what a story, Kendra. The last question I have for you is how how is your transit system viewed, would you say, by members of the Cherokee Nation? 
and how is it utilized? Is it utilized, you know, do you have a lot of utilization of the service? Oh, we have so much utilization of the service. Our riders, just like anywhere else, they are, uh, so many of them are completely dependent upon transportation. And we're just so thankful to have such a, a wonderful working relationship with the tribes to uh, complete these wonderful trips and take these people. Uh, some of these trips are really long too, Paul. You know, the Cherokee Days yes. deep into some areas. And and so, you know, it, it's just a benefit all around. It's a win-win for everybody who's involved in this project. And we're very proud of it. Well, congratulations, Kendra, for the great work you're doing. An example, I think, to midsize and smaller transit agencies across the nation. Uh, in, in, uh, do you have a website that people can contact if they want to see how you do things? You bet. www.pelivan.com. There you go. P-E-L-I-V-A-N. Yes, Pelivan. There you All go. All right. Congratulations, Kendra. And thanks for being on the show. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you for listening to Transit Unplugged in-depth with our special guest, Kendra McGady, director of Pelivan Transit in Oklahoma. And next week on Transit Unplugged News and Views, we have Craig Cipriano, Senior Vice President, National Director of Zero Emissions Mobility at STV. Don't forget to visit transitunplugged.com, sign up for the newsletter, so you're always in the loop with whatever is going on with the show. But if you have a question, comment, or would like to be a guest on the show, feel free to email us at info at transitunplugged.com. So until next week, ride safe and ride happy. We hope you're enjoying this episode of Transit Unplugged, the podcast. How would you like to see behind the scenes footage of the agencies that Paul visits? Then be sure to check out the new Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube where transit evangelist Paul Comfort dives into the culture, the food, and the transit of major cities around the world. You'll see the operations control centers, how maintenance shops work, and the latest innovations taking place at agencies around the globe as we work together to improve the lives of our transit riders and our communities. Be sure to subscribe to Transit Unplugged TV on YouTube or at transitunplugged.com.